if a small group of secretive people manipulate and control one of the two great parties in Great Britain, what will they do when they have control of MI5, when they have control of all the levers of the state? Are they suddenly going to believe in justice, in proper investigations, in fairness, or are they going to be the same as they are now, or even worse? Al Jazeera has obtained the largest leak of documents in British political history. Oh my God, this is unbelievable. It is absolutely shocking. Hundreds of thousands of internal communications expose how operatives secretly take control of Britain's Labour Party. The Labour Party is a criminal conspiracy against its members. Free speech was shut down. They tell the inside story of how Sir Keir Starmer, who could be Britain's next prime minister, leads a lawless party. I've waited 17 months to appear in front of you in this hall as leader of our great party. Confidential documents expose tactics to discredit and expel rivals in the party. People are actually quite dangerous who are in with the Labour Party. They were playing with people's lives here. They reveal how Starmer's predecessor was undermined by a smear campaign from within. It disabled him as a politician and as a potential prime minister. Really nice to see you here. Bye. How British democracy, known as the mother of parliaments, is being undermined by spying and dirty tricks. No one would expect that a political party would associate themselves with the whole-scale hacking of the press. It's look like somebody is constantly monitoring me, where I'm going and where my car is parked and where my children is going. It just stinks to high heaven what they're doing in the background. We speak to people whose voices have been silenced, including those who support Palestinian rights. It's very painful. As Palestinians, there was no room for us to enter this debate, and that's how it was designed to be. And the files reveal how a hierarchy of racism exists under Starmer's leadership. I face more racism in the Labour Party than I have in the rest of my life combined. In episode one of The Labour Files... They don't care about the truth. They want control. How unelected party officials suspend and expel opponents in the party. They were sabotaging the democratic will of the party. People will be absolutely furious when this gets out into the public domain. I love the city of Liverpool. Even though we've not been as rich as other cities uh, financially, We've been very rich in terms of our perceptions of each other and our aspirations for a city that is fair and equal and democratic. Anna Rothery is active in local politics. She has represented Labour, one of the two parties of government in Britain. Thousands of trade unionists searched to massive... I used to tag along with Mum, bust of the bread for the miners and the dockers. Liverpool is a bastion of Labour, a party born from trade unions and the working class. The city stands in contrast to southern counties of England, which overwhelmingly favour the right-wing Conservative Party. I think we're always known as a, a fight-back city. You know, we are very steadfast in terms of fighting against injustice. We don't quit. We continue to fight until we see the movement that we need to see. Build bridges, not walls. In 2015, Labour Party members across Britain elect a new leader. He has a radical vision that challenges Britain's establishment. The wonderful campaign that I was involved with, that I was so proud to lead, brought a lot of people back into politics because they believed there was something on offer for them. Membership of the Labour Party doubles. The files tell the story of how the hopes of many new party supporters are crushed. How established politicians and party bureaucrats use the media to destroy a movement that sought to change British society. 
It's no secret that quite a lot of papers had it in for Corbyn. They were open. They wanted to hear that Corbyn was a thug or his supporters were thugs. And so they didn't probably investigate these claims with the professionalism, which we, I'm including myself in this, should have done. This is obviously a very disappointing night for the Labour Party with the result... Corbyn loses two elections. I will not lead the party in any future general election campaign. The Labour Files tell the inside story of what happened to Corbyn. When he is elected four years earlier, he has no control over the party's bureaucracy. As leader of the opposition party in British politics, Corbyn has his own office. The General Secretary, Ian McNichol, is in charge of the party staff at its headquarters. It includes a legal unit then headed by John Stolliday. Below him are teams that deal with complaints and suspensions from the party. From the moment Jeremy Corbyn was elected, he faced complete opposition and resistance from the party's staff, the people who are paid to do the work of the party. The party headquarters is at a central London building called Southside. The senior staff of the Labour Party were operating a different strategy from that which the leadership, the democratically elected leadership, um, had decided upon. So they were sabotaging, if you like, the democratic will of the party. In Liverpool, the files tell the story of a city deprived of its voice. They closed ranks and went, we don't want anybody who's got an ounce of time for Jeremy Corbyn. The Labour files show how, behind the scenes, party bureaucrats prevent Rothery seeking higher office. She has a Jekyll and Hyde character, someone who can be right, quite rational, and then in seconds turns into a screaming banshee. It's a vile comment to make. Such a horrible comment to make about a woman. You know, a screaming banshee. When you get to the point where you think a little cabal like this can predetermine the direction of travel of an entire movement, we're in, you know, uncharted waters. It's a story that starts across the Mersey River in the summer of 2016. The Wallasey Labour Party was a really friendly organisation. There was no hostility, no arguments. There was the occasional debate about things where we differ. But there is a mood of crisis in the party. Jeremy Corbyn's Labour leadership is in crisis as he loses nine I told Jeremy Corbyn shadow. last night that I no longer had confidence the in Labour it. Party is in turmoil. with members of his shadow cabinet. I just feel the party needs leadership and direction. It's a disastrous weekend for the Labour Party. There'll be mass resignations by 11 shadow ministers. Please, for the sake of our party, leave He now. now needs to step aside. It becomes known as the chicken coup. In Wallasey, Labour Party members hold their annual meeting a year earlier, they had nominated Corbyn as party leader. The Member of Parliament for Wallasey is Angela Eagle. She is unable to attend the meeting. Our MP, Angela Eagle, had been very supportive of, of uh, Jeremy in the meetings where she would come along to constituency meetings and give a report about what had been going on. According to Runswick, the meeting ends without incident. A week later, a prominent opponent to Corbyn claims that Eagle, who is openly lesbian, is the victim of abuse. I got a phone call saying that there was a television program where Tessa Jowell was saying that Angela had been subject to homophobic uh, abuse at the meeting. I mean, I talked to um, Angela about her meeting. She faced homophobic abuse at that meeting. Angela wasn't at the meeting, but the inference was that she was. She wasn't. Activists and members of parliament and their staff are facing a day in, day out harassment and, in some cases, intimidation. 
I rang other people who were at the meeting. It was just a complete shock. We didn't know anything about it. No one heard this, you know. The sort of people be, oh, you don't use language like that. There was no homophobia or intimidation at the meeting. It's a very small room, so it would be very easy to hear what was being said by other people. The national media sees on the story. There was articles and television interviews saying that there'd been people shouting that Angela was a dyke, that um, there was homophobic gestures made and repeated homophobic comments. Then over the days and weeks to follow, the allegations grew into, first of all, it, it was widespread homophobia. What happened in Wallasey is to become the playbook of Corbyn's opponents in the party. The Labour files reveal the series of complaints filed by Eagle supporters to the party. Limp wrist gestures were made at our LGBT officer and nasty homophobic comments were made about our MP. I did not see any limp wrist gestures and there were no homophobic comments made about the MP. I had no homophobic abuse. I don't know anyone who did. And there was no other abuse. I've never seen such tosh in all my life. The room was full of trade unionists who are well aware that their jobs were on the line if any slurs about homophobia or misogyny were found to be true. I just was stunned. It didn't happen. And yes, I did repeatedly say that these things didn't happen because they didn't. As simple as that, and I'll say that forever. My daughter got married the day after the meeting and she married a woman. I wasn't alone on the top table with a relative who uh, identifies uh, uh, as bisexual. So it just seemed strange that anybody would think that we would allow that to go on. And here you have people who seem palpably decent, men and women, in order to damage the local Labour Party. A real horrible hatchet job is being done on the local members. Eagle then reveals her intention not to support Corbyn, but to challenge him. Today, I'm announcing my decision to stand for the leadership of the Labour Party. <laughs> there needed to be a distraction from the fact that Wallasey constituency were not supporting their MPs' leadership bid. Angela Eagle and her staff started to become paranoid that she was going to be deselected, as in her local members would say, well, we don't want you to, to be our MP next time there's an, a general election. Um, and so that was something which they, they were very animated about. I'm looking forward to having a debate with Jeremy Corbyn about the things that really matter to our country. A councillor, Paul Stewart, compiles a dossier of complaints from 17 people claiming they heard homophobic comments. It must have been said very loudly. Now, those 17 people heard it. Other people in the room would also have heard it, but didn't hear it because it wasn't said. Stewart sends the dossier to party headquarters. I have also attached a slip of paper that was handed to me previously by a Momentum member. Momentum was an organisation set up in 2015 to give some kind of organisational form to the, the movement that, that supported Jeremy Corbyn. Stewart claims the note is evidence of a plot by Momentum. How to take control of Labour Party meetings. It's not the kind of note that I've ever seen anyone circulating seriously. This is a note caricaturing 
what the militant tendency was accused of doing in the 1980s. At this year's Labour conference, militants and its supporters seem to have had as high a profile as ever. The militant tendency was a radical left faction that was accused of secretly plotting to take over the Labour Party. At that time, it controlled Liverpool's local government. For the right of the Labour Party, the battle against militants in the 1980s is, is kind of biblical. It's the foundation of their politics. A think tank from the right of the party publishes a review of a book about the militant tendency. It claims to describe militant strategy for taking over party meetings in the 1980s. The note from Councillor Stewart is copied directly from the book review. I don't know if somebody f has passed a note like that. I don't know that they're, they're totally bonkers if they have. I find it hard to believe that a document like that would be passed around that I wouldn't have got to hear about personally. Some people have said Tom Watson's there, he knows Tom how Watson, to Corbyn's deputy, but privately a critic, obtains Stuart's note. Watson then writes to Corbyn. There is no denying that tightly organised factions are organising within Momentum and the party. At the end of Watson's letter, he says, I attach a document that I am reliably informed is being shared between Momentum members with links to far-left parties, which summarises the methods used by Militant in the 1980s. I hope this note helps to dispel any remaining notion that entryism is a conspiracy theory. Paul Stewart's note ends up in the national media. As Tom Watson says, are you allowing Trotskyists and the hard left to infiltrate Labour? This is how facts are created in the political media space. You have something which is reportable and it can always be referred back to and it becomes one of these facts. Which, of course, isn't a fact. And that's how a large number of these, uh, these stories um, come about. I think the British media has a lot to answer for, including me. I remember reading this and thinking, yeah, well, that's, uh, you know, some of the Corbyn supporters are a rotten lot. The media should have done what the media is supposed to do, which is to question the official versions of the truth or the Labour Party version of the truth and gone and said, is it really what was really going on? The files reveal that Angela Eagle colluded with party bureaucrats in Labour's London headquarters. Stuart writes to senior party official Emily Oldno. I think that the constituency Labour Party is out of control and should be suspended with immediate effect. Oldno forwards the message to Ian McNichol, the party's general secretary. Obviously, anything would have to be agreed with Angela. McNichol responds. She is happy for constituency Labour Party to be suspended, and so am I. Oldno emails back. We have to do what Angela wants in these circumstances. Now, that, that's new to me because up until now, I've always said that I could never prove that Angela was involved in any of this, but I couldn't. Southside suspends Wallasey Labour Party. They are banned from holding official meetings. Paul Davies organises a public meeting. This is your chance to find out what is really going on in Wallasey Labour Party and your chance to have your say. Allies of Paul Stewart complain to party bureaucrats that Davies delivered the flyers only to the homes of party members. I witnessed Paul Davies posting the flyer through our letterboxes. No one else in our close received this flyer. Stewart claims Davies has illegally obtained party membership data. I am aghast that such clear data protection has been breached. Yet nothing seems to have been done about this? Stuart demands that Davies is expelled from the party 
and reported to the police. The police and or the Information Commissioner's Office should be informed of this clear breach of data. But Davies was not in Wallasey on the day they claim. I was in London, which is unusual. I don't go to London very often. And I got to see a show if I'm not rightly. But if I hadn't been in London, if I hadn't had train tickets, if I hadn't had credit cards, I would have been expelled from the Labour Party because some people got together and decided that would be a good way to get rid of me. A party official emails a colleague who handles investigations. Well, if he wasn't even in town, a bit lucky we didn't suspend him. Well, I like him. He's got a sense of humour. It's a bit lucky they didn't suspend me. If that had been me, I'd have been saying, well, how did this happen? Well, they know how it happened. They know that people are getting together to construct evidence against little old me. Metadata from the files reveals who wrote the complaints against Davies. Right, so if you've got the original email or, or document, you can get to who authored it. And the author is the email address of Paul Stewart because I've emailed him. So Paul Stewart uh, wrote that document um, for one at least of his relatives and friends to sign. Davies dares the accusers to take a lie detector test in front of journalists. Party headquarters suspends him from the Labour Party for two years. John Stolliday leads the legal department. Reporting to him is the head of the Sputes, Sam Matthews. He's charged with investigating the alleged homophobic comments. Only four of the original 17 complainants heard any. Four people explicitly claim to have heard the Dyke comment. Three of those four people have the same surname. I interviewed one of them and I firmly believe his account. The common surname is Stuart. The party's official report on Wallasey claims that Eagle received many hundreds of abusive, homophobic and frightening messages sent by Labour members. The files show that, despite this claim, no Labour Party members are suspended for homophobic behaviour. But Matthews keeps the constituency party suspended for over a year. He emails Old No. I have every sympathy for the fact that Angela is still in a difficult situation as they are properly organised in her constituency. Matthews also recognises that Wallasey's membership supports Corbyn and not Angela Eagle. My worry is that based on track record, no matter how much time we give Angela to organise, so little work will go into it that we'll end up getting asked to extend it further and further. So we have no democracy. If you have an inner core of six, eight or ten people nationally with their tentacles spreading out to the various regions, saying who can be a candidate, saying who can be a member, then you control the body politic of one of the major parties in this country. And I find that is undemocratic. Basically, it's a coup by a group of people to take over one of the major political parties in Britain. Brighton is a progressive city in the UK. It's kind of known for being progressive. It's known for being kind of liberal, left-leaning. And obviously, the movement behind Jeremy Corbyn was very strong in Brighton and actually in other places on the south coast. The local branch becomes the largest in the country with over 6,000 members. The party organises its first general meeting since Corbyn became leader. The atmosphere in the Labour Party under Jeremy Corbyn was one of optimism, was one of cheer, was one of solidarity. We organised a rally before the annual meeting of the city party. Anyone was invited, and we had about seven, 800 people there. A week before the meeting, the leader of the Labour group in the Brighton City Council sends an email to his supporters. I'm emailing to ask you a favour. Next Saturday, 
our city Labour Party faces a takeover by a group of individuals from Momentum and other fringe left-wing groups. This party has faced down militant before. I'm asking you to help do that again. I was a member of Momentum at that time, and we decided we would run a left slate, which we did. We went into that meeting open, honest, transparent, to make speeches, and when we were elected, we were very pleased. We all had 65% of the vote. Two in three people attending it, a record turnout, a record majority, had won. Fantastic. But actually, in retrospect, we went into that meeting like lambs to the slaughter. We had no idea of the level of corruption and conspiracy and lies and abuse that would follow as a consequence of a democratic election within Brighton. And then I got a call. It was about 10.30, I think, that night. I was just outside the theatre. It was a call from someone in Jeremy Corbyn's office, someone I knew. And she said... I thought she was ringing to congratulate me as I got texts and phone calls. But no, she rang me and said, yes, we've, we've got to do something about the spitting. We've got to be able to rebut the spitting. I said, what? What spitting? The following day, Morgan sends a complaint to Labour's regional office. Venue staff were allegedly spat at. Others were verbally intimidated. Our organiser was assaulted and abused. I've no hesitation in saying that this is a hostile takeover of the party. These fake accusations were shooting around the world before truth gets its boots on you. It took me 48 hours to piece together what anybody could have pieced together. And that is, lies had been told. They'd been told repeatedly. Over two or three days, with repeated opportunities, they lied. They lied, lied, and lied again. I took 78 statements, 23,000 words, named people who attended, and every single person said there was nothing wrong. When I got the CCTV footage proving there was no spitting, the allegations disappeared. Despite having no evidence that spitting or aggression took place, the files show that Labour's legal unit is intent on overturning the victory of the pro-Corbyn faction. Catherine Buckingham from the Disputes Unit writes to her boss. What's your feeling on Brighton? The head of the legal unit replies. Exactly what you proposed. Overturn the annual general meeting, deal with individuals, while we worry about applying the rules correctly and legal niceties. Buckingham feels confident that the rules don't matter. It's all about to come to a head. I'm not worried about any of those things. I say act now and worry about those things later. Days later, the results of the election are overturned and the constituency is suspended. The biggest mistake I've made, apart from joining the Labour Party in the first place, was winning an election in the Labour Party, and they can't stand that. In a residential suburb of London, Labour Party members meet to discuss the role of their local MP in the so-called chicken coup against Corbyn. Feelings were running quite high because there was a perception that the MP in Harrow West, Gareth Thomas, had been very unsupportive towards Jeremy Corbyn, the leader, and had resigned from the shadow cabinet. And there was a motion that, that criticised Gareth Thomas for this. And various people spoke in favour of it. Um, but I actually spoke against it because I didn't think it would be that helpful. Pamela Fitzpatrick says the mood suddenly turned sour. 
Michael Borio, who was a councillor, became very agitated and stood up and started shouting, shouting primarily at me, and was very aggressive. Um, I didn't respond. I continued to re respond to the chair, and I remained calm throughout that time. And the meeting ended, and that was that, really. Fitzpatrick is suspended from the Labour Party. No reason is given. I was really, really upset, in tears a lot of the time, actually, over this. The files reveal that a complaint made by Michael Borio led to Fitzpatrick's suspension. So I've got an email here from Councillor Michael Borio. I haven't seen this before. None of this I've actually said, which is quite shocking. At a meeting where Michael Borio was aggressive and shouting at me, and at which I've not responded, he's actually twisted it so that I'm the aggressor shouting at him and being rude at him. I was shouted down and heckled by Councillor Fitzpatrick. We should listen to others with respect and not heckle, abuse, bully or attack our fellow Labour colleagues. It is completely fabricated. So how is that a fair process? It's, it's astonishing that a party that calls itself a democratic party would behave like this. The branch chair compares the methods used to suspend Fitzpatrick to those of Soviet spies. The suspensions were done in a draconian and secretive way, which owed more to the style of the KGB than the Labour Party. I was really, really affected by it, actually, and had started to suffer with depression and anxiety about going to meetings. That was the first time I started to worry that when I went to meetings, I was going to be attacked. The files reveal the role of local Labour MP Gareth Thomas in expelling members of his own party. Thomas sends a letter to General Secretary Ian McNichol asking for pro-Corbyn activists in Harrow to be treated more harshly. Thomas proposes. Reviewing the disciplinary procedures. I am concerned that the party has decided to rescind their suspensions and allow them to continue their infiltration activities into Harrow West. The London Regional Organiser writes to Head of Disputes Sam Matthews. Regarding Pamela Fitzpatrick, Gareth is getting very worried about it all and wants to come in to have a chat about it. Gareth is chasing via Ian's office. This email confirms that Gareth was behind all of this, including me. And he publicly will say that he's very supportive of me. He's actually written, whilst he was planning to get rid of me, he's written letters in support of me that he'll send to local people to tell them that he's actually supporting me. The files reveal that a number of MPs are involved in the purging of members of their own constituency party. The MP for Hove is Peter Kyle. He sends an email to the governance and legal unit. Rebecca Massey, I would like to direct you in the strongest terms to investigate and to remove the member from the party. You will see a pattern of behavior online which is also replicated in person. She is regularly aggressive to my staff and myself at meetings. I think it's very important that abusive and uncomradely behaviour is dealt with by the party. It's astonishing that at that time, an MP would be making those assertions in order to get me expelled from the Labour Party. A man I will say, I've had in my own house for meetings. I'm not an aggressive person. Rebecca Massey avoids disciplinary measures and is elected as chair of a local branch. 
A former MP, Ivor Kaplan, is in the same branch. He complains to the regional office. I must immediately request that this person's membership is suspended and subject to further investigation. Kaplan sends a link to an article by a group known as the Campaign Against Anti-Semitism. Massey's tweets describe her view of the influence of the pro-Israel lobby in Britain. The article states that Massey is dedicated to the demonization of Israel. It also alleges that a problem of anti-Semitism in the Labour Party rests squarely in the black hearts of individuals like her. There was a whole article about how I was an anti-Semite. I began to be traduced. February the 3rd, 2017, was the day that anti-Semitism was used for the first time in Brighton and Hove as a weapon against pro-Corbyn candidates. Because it was on the 3rd of February that the Campaign Against Anti-Semitism published a shocking article about Becky, immediately amplified, retweeted, and drawn to the attention of media. From that initial one story, there has been six years of abuse following, always referring back to that initial story. And that's gone on for six, six years now. A month earlier, Al Jazeera broadcast an investigation into Israel's attempts to influence British politics. Using an undercover reporter, Al Jazeera's investigative unit exposes Israel's clandestine activities in London, a city that's become a major battleground. One of Israel's main targets is the Labour Party. For the first time, its leader is a champion of Palestinian civil rights. They'd be very happy to see Jeremy Corbyn no longer leader of the Labour Party, for sure. It's a covert action that penetrates the heart of Britain's democracy. A senior political officer at the Israeli embassy discusses with a British civil servant how to deal with MPs who are critical of Israel. Can I give you some MPs that you suggest that you would take down? <laughs> The investigation forces the Israeli ambassador to apologize to the British government and the diplomat is sent home. The diplomat in question uh, no longer seems to be a functionary of the embassy in London. Uh, and so whatever, whatever he may exactly have been doing here, his cover can uh, be said to have been well and truly blown. The undercover operation also shows how a former employee at the Israeli embassy becomes leader of the Jewish labor movement. So I've been introduced, I'm Ella, I am Jair Lamb's barbecue in chief um, and new director. It's probably hire someone political who actually knows, you know, what they're doing. Before that, I was at the embassy working with Shai. I don't know where they belong. Shai is the name of the disgraced Israeli operative. Ella Rose discusses methods she favours to deal with rivals within the party. Jackie Walker is a pro-Corbyn activist who supports civil rights for Palestinians. I saw Jackie Walker on Saturday and thought, you know what, I can take her. She's like 5'2 and tiny. And there we go and their existence. As far as I'm concerned, they can go dry and Well, it, it's interesting to see that again, because obviously I have seen it before. And just the sort of smugness of the woman talking about not only a fellow Jew and a fellow Labour Party member, as Jackie says, but a, a woman. <laughs> um, it's, it's extraordinary. Naomi Wimborne Idrisi is one of several party members who complain. So a few of us women in the Labour Party who were Jewish got together and we sent in an official complaint. And we wrote to Ian McNichol, who was uh, General Secretary at the time, and we said, obviously, it's completely inappropriate for a, a Labour Party member to be talking about another, another party member in this, in this way. Um, what did he intend to do about it? 
The Labour files reveal that party officials treat Rose very differently to members who criticize Israel. Rose emails Sam Matthews, the then head of disputes. I would very much like to volunteer to come and meet with you and all relevant members of the disputes team next week in order to clear this matter up at the earliest opportunity. Four days later, Rose meets Matthews. Had I known that our private meeting had been covertly recorded with the intention to broadcast our conversation on an international network, I would have never made those comments. Days later, Matthews writes to Rose. At interview, you said that you understood the language you used was ugly and in retrospect, you wished you had not used those words. You noted that there isn't, nor will there ever be, any public record of you using such language. For the reasons outlined above, the Labour Party will be taking no further action on this matter. Within a few days, um, I got an email back saying thank you very much. I've looked into this. Um, we've reminded Miss Rose of uh, the conduct expected of members of the Labour Party. Case closed. Goodbye. The files include Wimborne Idrissi's email asking the General Secretary to bring the decision on Rose before the party's governing body, the NEC. We are disappointed to have received no response to our email calling for a review of Ian McNichol's judgment on our complaint against Ella Rose. We look forward to hearing what the NEC plans to do to correct the current unsatisfactory situation. <laughs> Sir McNichol's immediate response is to mail Stoliday, Matthews and Old Now saying Happy Friday. Nice. And then Stoliday gets back to him, Matthews and Old Now. Don't think it needs a response. We said clearly matter is closed. The Labour movement stands for decency and fairness. And looking at the Yellow Rose disciplinary case, it, it, it's, it's, it's sort of chummy. Uh, uh, you know, this very rapid exchange of emails, the personal meeting, the declaration uh, that the case is closed. Rose's case will not be discussed by the National Executive Committee because Stoliday, the head of the party's legal unit, ensures it is dealt with secretly. A day after Matthews clears Rose, Stoliday sends an email to fellow official Odno. He briefed an official on the NEC. She is fine, says important that we deal with it informally and don't take it to NEC where everyone will get worked up. Matthew tells members of the NEC that Rose's case has been handled according to standard procedure. Officers applied, I think I'm going to have a giggle here. Officers applied exactly the same standards as they do for all investigations when deciding the most proportionate recommendation to make. <laughs> Sorry, that's hilarious really, isn't it? Never mind. It looks like an example of abuse, and it's sort of thing that ought to have gone to the NEC. As far as I'm concerned, they can't go dying off. It looks like look, there's a set of double standards going on here, that Ella Rose is being treated in a different way, more friendly way, after abusive behaviour, which she acknowledges, than uh, people in Brighton and in Wallasey, etc. In northwest London, Fitzpatrick's suspension is overturned, and she becomes Labour's parliamentary candidate in Harrow East. The constituency debates whether to affiliate to Jewish Voice for Labour or JVL. JVL represents Jewish members who are critical towards the state of Israel. The Jewish Labour Movement, or JLM, supports Israel. There was a debate, which was a very civilised debate. It was a very balanced thing. They voted overwhelmingly to support Jewish Voice for Labour. Fitzpatrick suddenly receives a flurry of aggressive tweets. The next day, 
There were um, comments on social media attacking me for uh, Harrow East having affiliated to Jewish Voice for Labour and asking me to condemn Jewish Voice for Labour. It just kept getting worse and worse. And then it was, well, your silence means, you know, you support it. Your silence means you support Holocaust deniers. And then it turned into, you are a Holocaust denier. One of the accounts attacking Fitzpatrick belongs to a Labour Party activist, Luke Stanger. Councillor Fitzpatrick's selection has already caused alarm to some in the Jewish community. It's stirring things up and creating this perception that somehow I'm anti-Semitic. Um, it's really upsetting for me, really, really upsetting. Stanger contacts an employee of Fitzpatrick's on Facebook. I have been asked by a moderate councillor in Harrow to help build up a social media dossier on her which can then be leaked out and will hopefully result in the suspension of her candidacy. She seems a nasty, sectarian mouthpiece for the hard left. I did some research and then found that there were other people that he attacked. I'm one of many women um, who's been on the receiving end of Luke Stanger's abuse over the years. He started pretty much kind of con constantly and relentlessly writing abusive tweets um, about me. He uses words like crazed, deranged, repellent, rancid, grandma, this kind of language. Now, this isn't the language of political discourse, and nobody could argue that it is. But that's the kind of language that Luke Stanger uses. How are you, Spurs? Happy day! Luke Stanger then became uh, associated with a group called Sussex Friends of Israel. And uh, Luke Stanger would appear with some of the characters from Sussex Friends of Israel, where there were pro Palestinian stalls or leafleting. Luke Stanger would appear and he would walk around filming. He's one of those people that just seems to be able to act with impunity, that whatever he does is going to be acceptable to party officials. And you can't help being suspicious, really, about, you know, who's backing him, who's supporting him. You know, how does he manage to continue in the way he does? After multiple complaints are filed, the Labour Party suspends Stanger. The party sends Stanger a questionnaire inviting him to respond to the allegations. Stanger rejects the accusation that he has broken any of the party's rules or codes of conduct. Metadata in the Labour files reveals that Stanger didn't write the letter himself. Oh, OK. Oh. OK. So this shows that the author of what I've been looking at by Luke Stanger is another Luke, Luke Akehurst. Luke Akehurst is an influential figure in the Labour Party and now sits on the party's National Executive Committee. He's also a key figure in the pro-Israel lobby, a director of We Believe in Israel. <laughs> oh, my. Word. So the author of those documents, surprise, surprise, is Luke Akehurst. Luke Akehurst is known to be the anti corbynista of all anti corbynistas What this makes me feel is I had the sense all along that this was organised. Now, Luke Akehurst is behaving like this. It, it's, it's quite shocking, really.
We've always had a diverse mix of communities in Liverpool. The proudest thing I would say is that I've made politics accessible to people. I've shown them that, you know, you can represent communities. It was about making sure that we did have the political representation and have a say on how the city was run. The Labour files reveal how Keir Starmer's enforcers take control of the selection of the party's candidates. One of those men arrested is the mayor of Liverpool. On suspicion of conspiracy to commit bribery and witness intimidation. When Liverpool's mayor is arrested, it sparks a new selection process for the party's candidate in the upcoming election for mayor. Anna Rothery seeks the party's nomination. I believe real change comes from the ground up, not the top down. And it's on that basis that I ask for your support. A panel of party representatives interview Rothery. She is selected with two other candidates for a vote by Labour members in Liverpool. I was very surprised in terms of the way people rallied round to support me. Rothery was backed by one of Britain's largest trade unions. I was endorsed by United. I was also endorsed by many MPs. I was also endorsed by Jeremy Corbyn. I'm absolutely delighted to support Anna Rothery as our candidate to be Liverpool's mayor. It's great to have, you know, those endorsements by public figures, but the most meaningful endorsements came from the people of Liverpool. As far as I was aware, it was then down to the people of Liverpool to choose who they wanted to be their candidate. Former leader Jeremy Corbyn is one of the latest victims of the purge against the left of the party. He was suspended from the party's ranks in Parliament. Thank Will you. you be restoring the whip? I put the statement out last night, thank you. In Britain, it is called having the whip removed. Thank you very much for coming. Rothery speaks out against the party's treatment of Corbyn. I'd like to see the whip restored to Jeremy and the constituency Labour Party officers who have faced arbitrary suspension to be reinstated. Rothery's statement lands in the inbox of senior officials at party headquarters. One of our Liverpool candidates, not ideal. A fellow Labour councillor in Liverpool also emails London headquarters. Anna continued to call for the restoration of the whip to Jeremy Corbyn. This action has seen constituency Labour Party members suspended, but we're turning a blind eye to this? Party officials in Southside discuss dealing with Rothery. Anything to do or see here? I don't see anything that's really actionable in this. Well, they're obviously trying to filter for information that's going to be detrimental. It seems as though they're trying to discredit me as a, you know, a viable candidate. Then something unexpected happens. The next thing I got, an email saying, we're going to have to hold off in terms of the elections. The panel want to invite the three candidates back to another interview. I didn't really understand what was behind it. I just thought it was just maybe they wanted to check some facts. A letter arrives in the inbox of the new Labour Party General Secretary, David Evans. It comes from Alan Dean, a former Labour councillor in Liverpool. Dear David, I've been asked to contact you in relation to Councillor Anna Rothery and her unsuitability to stand as Labour's candidate for the position of elected mayor of Liverpool. I'm firmly of the opinion that she would be a, a disaster, <laughs> a disaster for the city and the Labour Party if she were to become the elected mayor. It went on. Her sudden conversion to and support from various senior Corbynista MPs is of huge concern for the direction she would take. Well, you know, it, it's all beginning to slot into place. You know, the more I'm reading, I'm thinking, this was a conservative effort by very senior people to, you know, to disparage, you know, me as, a, as an individual. 
the letter makes comments about Rothery's family. I don't even want to repeat that. It, it's just so untrue, it's un, you know. And, you know, it just tells me that um, he's such a vicious individual to bring people's children into something. This is really dirty business, this, you know. Dean's letter also raises an incident involving a fellow Labour councillor a decade earlier. When the councillor, which was Nick Small, came to my table, I knew it was going to be nothing but trouble because there was being trouble. And I'd got to the point where I just avoided him. And so he gradually worked his way round and he said, um, you know, you only got that position because you're black. And I just ignored him. A version of the row is leaked to a Liverpool newspaper alleging that Rothery had prodded Nick Small on the head. A party officer conducts an internal investigation. I don't know what investigation he did, but I know what the outcome was, was that uh, Nick Small apologised to me. Dean's letter contains a condemnation of Rothery. She has proven herself to be untrustworthy, dishonest person, someone who is solely motivated by her ego, status and financial gain. The Labour files do not establish who asked Dean to write the letter to the party general secretary. And it's obviously designed or orchestrated, you know, to feed into something much bigger out of my control in terms of what they're trying to do. Rothery goes to her second interview with a selection panel, but this time it's very different. I think I knew within the first couple of seconds that there was something not quite right about it, um, because the demeanour had changed in terms of the panel. The encounter with Small is raised. I was literally told by one of the panel members that there'd been an incident in 2011 that would bring the party into disrepute. Um, because I'd slapped or punched or hit Nick Small. They felt that Nick Small had made an, a complaint against me, whereas when I said that I'd made it against him, they kind of, like, looked a bit deflated, to say the least. I was walking with my youngest boy to the nearby school. Near the school, I saw Luke Stanger. Luke Stanger remains suspended while the party investigates his case. According to his notice, a suspended member shall not represent the party in any position at any level. Social media posts show him campaigning for Labour MPs during the 2019 general election. He saw me, I saw him. Um, I didn't know him, I knew of him, and I didn't want to talk to him. Then I received a private message from Luke Stanger, which was a shock. It said something along the lines of, um, good to see you on the morning run with your son. So not unfriendly, but I didn't interpret it as a friendly act. McCarthy is then accused of anti-Semitism. I'm at home with my family, and I start seeing these things appearing on my phone about me being a vile anti-Semite. And uh, completely disgraceful. And these vile, horrendous allegations are being made against me. I am not an anti-Semite. I absolutely detest that um, allegation. It is completely and utterly untruthful. I'm an anti-racist. I'm proud to be an anti-racist. Stanger increases the intimidation. My workplace was telephoned by Luke Stanger and uh, reception took a message and they said they wanted to speak. Be 
because there was a dossier on me. And I, I thought, what the hell is going on here? I didn't respond. My stepdad was the owner of the firm at the time, and he didn't respond either. A few days later, we received a, another phone call from Jonathan Hoffman. Jonathan Hoffman is a pro-Israel activist and an advisor to the campaigning group Labour Against Anti-Semitism. He's been convicted of aggressive and bullying behaviour. Jonathan Hoffman said something along the lines of that he had a dossier on me and wanted that to be shown. Then the dossier was sent through to my pa's, to my stepdad, my pa's private email address. And that dossier was horrendous reading. It was awful. It was um, interactions of me with someone online where uh, that person said they wanted to behead my family. They wanted to behead me and my family. And they said a whole number of things. I don't know if I can repeat them. I can't repeat them about my mother. To make those threats against me and my family, and to say those things about my mother, uh, my stepdad read that, and he was very upset about reading all of that. Is I can't, I can't talk about most of it. My mum worked for the NHS. She was a good person. In Liverpool, Anna Rothery decides to seek legal advice. Her lawyer accuses the interview panel of subjecting her to... an unfair, arbitrary, capricious and irrational process they seek legal redress. Our client will seek an emergency interim injunction to enable her name to go forward on the ballot to Labour members in Liverpool. And so we decided that we would ask them to halt the process in terms of the, the vote, etc., and to give them time to put a case forward as to why I couldn't stand. Rothery's lawyer reminds the Labour Party that it has a legal duty to preserve all relevant documents in your control. Including any documents passing between you and the other panel members. The panel decides to exclude Rothery and both other candidates from the shortlist. We were basically told that they were reopening the contest and we need no reply. The party tells her that the decision was taken after giving careful consideration to the additional information presented to it. I still was, you know, doing the juices of Lord Mayor. I just felt completely deflated and undermined. I felt like it being a full-blown character assassination. I still can't make out a tale of it, even all this time after. Rothery's lawyer seeks an injunction. He asserts the legal right to view evidence. Please disclose all additional information presented about our client. The party's lawyers respond to Rothery's request for disclosure of documents. We decline to provide the disclosure requested. None of the documents you seek from the Labour Party appears to be relevant to the decision to remove your client from the shortlist. Alan Dean's letter is never presented to Rothery's lawyer or to the court. Nor is a letter sent by Nick Small repeating the allegation that Rothery had prodded him at a dinner in 2011.
Right, like weird. The, the time and effort has gone into this on their behalf. The Labour Party has an obligation to, uh, to observe due process and fair dealing. So the, the, the judge wasn't given the full picture. Now, there is a problem here. If that's the way the Labour Party is conducting itself in opposition, under, let's remember, Keir Starmer, the former Director of Public Prosecutions, is Sir Keir Starmer now going to behave like that in power? The injunction is refused and Rothery ordered to pay $90,000 in costs to the party. I think I was literally hung out to dry by a party that I've been loyal to for many years. At Labour headquarters, the General Secretary congratulates the party's senior lawyer, Alex Burroughs-Curtis. Thoroughly well done. Your contract has been agreed. We will not be including a win bonus. The activist Luke Stanger is seeking to overturn his suspension from the party. He is represented by an expensive City of London law firm. Mish Kondorea are hired to challenge Stanger's suspension. The Labour files reveal the support that Stanger enjoys amongst senior politicians from the right of the party. He receives character references from 14 MPs, 30 councillors and dozens of party activists. Gareth Thomas, the Labour MP for Harrow West. I was very sad to hear of Luke Stanger's recent suspension from the Labour Party. I hope his case can be concluded soon and he can continue to be a good friend to Harrow Labour in future years to come. And I think that people are actually quite dangerous who are in with the Labour Party. The way that they're behaving, it's, it's quite astonishing, really. The Labour Party now welcomes apartheid-supporting racists and abusers of women. And how that could possibly have happened is beyond me. Stanger is on the campaign team for Peter Kyle, the Labour MP for Hove. Stanger describes himself as his representative. Kyle sends Stanger an email. I have always found you an amazing, active campaigner on behalf of the Labour Party. Well, I'm not the same person. That is certainly true. In terms of security, I'm always thinking about locks on doors, windows, where are, where is my family? Um, I'm always worried about them. And so on me and my family, all of my family, we are frightened as a result of what's happened to us. Steve Reed, Labour MP for Croydon North and now Opposition Minister for Justice, praises Stanger. I have met Luke many times while out campaigning for the Labour Party. It would be wrong to exclude him from continuing to play a role in the party he loves so much. The Labour Party doesn't care. I've reported all of this to the Labour Party. At the end of the day, that evil took place and, you know, it's still a scar. It's still a scar on me. It's a scar on my sister, my whole family and it's still there. It's, no one has dealt with it. No one has dealt with this. The highest disciplinary body in the party votes to expel Stanger, but his expulsion is never carried out. The former head of the governance and legal unit, John Stolliday, voices his support. Luke is a gentle giant who gives his all to his progressive political beliefs and his deep commitment to equality and, above all, getting Labour elected. My dad read those 
terrible comments. And he was upset about that. And he died not long after that. So that evil that was put into our lives caused my pa to die. I'm sure that was a central part of what happened. And the lack of safety for me and my family, the awful words that were used about my mother, I, I, I think I'm still in a state of shock. I don't think I'll ever get over it. It's a completely despicable place to find ourselves after people have made so many sacrifices over so many decades fighting for the party that represents the working classes to end up at this point where we're being betrayed by our own party. It's a big no-no in my eyes. The Labour Party is a criminal conspiracy against its members. It acts unlawfully, it libels its members, it gives no natural justice to those accused of offences, and it tears up the rule book, the constitution, on a whim. In the second episode of The Labour Files, the true story behind the party's anti-Semitism crisis. I feel so ashamed right now that it's come to this. I'm Jewish! Are people like you speaking for me? How truth was subverted. Oh, Jeremy's a racist! And reality turned on its head. That's an absolute lie. I didn't say that. The media was not interested in the reality of the story. Shut your mouth! 